This episode is brought to you by Canopy. Canopy Canopy.us backslash classical. Hi, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about the classical world, ancient stuff, old things, education, books, uh, art, and but definitely not math. We don't do that stuff here. We stay away from that. Math is lame. We don't touch math that garbage. Modern. I hate math. Yeah, math is modern. <laughs> math is a modern invention. And uh, well, have nothing to do with anything that's less than yeah. 100 years old. So no, I never saw a triangle before. That's right. Wait, what? What, 19? What, what year is it? 1921? 1921. What year? What, oh, the year of the triangle. You. Duh. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, naturally. Uh, my name is Graham Donaldson, and I'm here with my colleagues, Thomas <laughs> Magby. In Hi. Bermuda. And uh, AJ Hannenberg. That's actually pretty good. Sorry, this is Thomas again. I'm not AJ. Oh, AJ, do you want to say hello? Sorry. Hi. And uh, today we are I'll learning say. about math, I think. Is that sure. fair, Thomas? Uh, n- no. Oh, whoops. I'm always very unhelpful in my uh, titles for these episodes. So, uh, no, the subject of my uh, episode is is anxiety about giving this, ep- this episode. So hopefully you appreciate this. That Okay. So um, in I feel like I made this joke with both of you in preparing for in talking about what I was going to discuss today that I, I felt almost like I was threatening you all when I would say I'm going to do an episode on math because I think most people don't find that topic interesting. I know you two are very kind and supportive people, but I could also I would not blame a, lis- a listener who looked at the title and was like, I don't want to I don't want to hear about this topic. So in, we'll get in a roundabout way to my topic because that's the only way I ever enter into any of my topics. Um, so uh, gentlemen, I, let's let's start somewhere else before we get into maybe the meat of the episode today. Um, I've been thinking about um, changing all of your classes. Cool. So I know that you all currently teach 9th, 10th, and 12th grade um, English mm-hmm. yeah. combined, but I, I think I have a better way to do it. Sweet. Rock let's roll. do it. Okay. So normally you all teach. So 9th grade, you read like old books. 10th grade, you read like... That's super lame. Yeah, super lame. Medieval um, books. Less old books. And then 11th grade, they read not old books. They read American books. And then in 12th grade, you read new books. Well, I mean, there are a mishmash in there. Oh, you read a mishmash in 12th grade. Well, then, you know, I don't like that. <laughs> mishmash. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, English teacher. So here's my plan for a new English curriculum. Are you ready? Yep. Mm-hmm. Ninth grade, we're going to teach grammar. Okay. Now, only the rules of grammar. We're not going to like read long passages at, at any point. We're only going to teach the rules of grammar. They're going to memorize the Latin phrases for those different forms of grammar. And we're just going to like hammer that home every day for a year. Okay. That's not fantastic. Grade. My job gets way easier. <laughs> That's wow. Ooh, wow. That, that, that'll tie in later. This is good. In 10th grade, mm-hmm. we're going to do an entire year on spelling. Now, again, we don't want any long passages here. We just want the most difficult words that no one uses, right? Yep. So, like, complicated words that aren't actually very helpful, but that would prove that they've, like, memorized the worksheets we're like going to give them. Like chrysanthemum. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, like, good luck on that one. I, I have literally zero guess as to how to do that. Um, in 11th grade, um, so, you know how, like, there are different, like, genre of books and poetry? Mm-hmm. So we're going to have them memorize definitions of those different genres. Awesome. But not at, we don't want them to read those genres, but mm. we want them to like know the difference between like fiction and nonfiction or a biography and not Am a biography. Am I going to show them examples of fiction and nonfiction? We would never they need that. to be able to identify them? No, no. no we, 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 we wouldn't want that. Okay. Um, but so they just need to like learn those wor- the words themselves. Gotcha. So like a really good categorization system mm-hmm. is what we care about, but not being able to like read a work and know what it is. So would I give them like the definition, but slightly reworded so that they would have to say that's still the definition. That's exactly for right. Yeah. And that's what the test would be gotcha. actually is okay. them being able to identify which one is the actually correct definition. 100%. Excellent. Okay. Then is there going to be a, a unit on fonts. Ooh, I should have done that, but I didn't. I would love a font unit. How about we have an elective on fonts? Oh, that'd be great. And so you start with like Sarah for sans serif. And then like, how do you tell your Helvetica from your, you um, work your way up to papyrus. Yeah, if you get Helvetica font. for Arial. <laughs> the, the uh, Arial is the finest of fonts. Is that what No, I was saying, at? how can you tell your Helvetica from Arial? Right, from Arial, this is fair. Um, that's a that's a typeface joke for all you designers out there. Thanks for the two of is you. Is it who, the kerning? Is that the answer? They're almost identical. Are they actually? Yeah. Oh. One, one is just trademarked by Apple. Why do people love Helvetica then? Because it's trademarked? Um, I don't know. Oh, okay. Um, 12th grade, so that would be an elective, would be on fonts, mm-hmm. right? 
Yeah, literally just identifying fonts. Not yeah. actually writing anything in those okay. fonts or reading anything in those fonts, but just like literally... Or making their own fonts. How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> They're not ready for that okay. level. And the 12th grade is the really exciting one. So as you all know, Mortimer Adler has a list of 102 great ideas that he kicks off the great books of the Western world with. So what students will do their 12th grade year is they will get a dictionary and they will define each of those 102 words. And that they're going to write that out by hand for over the course of the entire year. Cool. That's okay. So they're going to define what those great ideas are. In a font or in a serif or a sans serif <laughs> script. It's a very important difference. And that's yep. what their great hinges on. Okay. So grammar, spelling, they'll learn how to categorize things and then they will define very important great ideas, but not actually talk about them. Uh, Sounds I'm, miserable. I'm sorry. What? Sounds miserable. No, no. Um, well, AJ already said it would be easier to teach because mm-hmm. it's really easy to grade would be really nice. That's true. And you know, if they, got the information because like you know if they know one font versus the other it's pretty obvious if they can spell or not it's pretty obvious yep. so i don't understand it does make the homework grading very easy a lot easier mm-hmm. why would this be bad you're right that's not bad <laughs> wait no <laughs> yeah you're not supposed to fold so easily no uh <laughs> i'm into it no stop what <laughs> the first time you agree with me is this <laughs> wait no <laughs> okay i'm f- i'm starting an email to troy right now <laughs> yeah to uh Thomas had this really great idea on the podcast this today. for years. Yeah, good. This would be wonderful. <laughs> uh, why is this a bad way to teach English? Because it's not actually English. It's uh, not no, actually no. literature. Uh, you must not have heard me. Um, uh, it's grammar and spelling and a categorization. No, it's English. What do you What do you mean? They're definitions. Yeah, those are in English. Should Re- I have clarified it's the, the English language? language. Yeah, sure. so it's all in English. I don't... What? Why, why, why is this not English? Because they're not really engaging with the... The, the pra- point of English. Yeah, the practice. Sorry, what? What's the point of English? To feed our hearts and minds. Oh, wow. I hope all of your students who are listening, obviously all of them are listening, just to be clear. I hope they responded immediately with that answer, too. That's from your catechism, correct? It is. Yeah, that you read at the beginning why of the class. Why do we study English literature? To woo women. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the answer. That's what, not the answer. I don't know what you are teaching them, but I watched, uh, what was that, uh, the Oh, Captain, My Captain movie? Uh, Dead oh, Poets yeah, Society. Dead Poets. Yeah. Poets I watched Dead Poets Society. Yeah, yeah. Whole point. That wooing whole, women. Yeah, it's true. I don't know what women are going to do with my English class. That's... <laughs> I don't know. Why, I don't even know why they're in there. Does he actually say that? that be that's wooed, the reason to, yeah. It, oh, why, why do we read poetry to woo women? This is unfortunate. He uh, was a great teacher. He got, fired, he got fired after a year. Remember <laughs> that is actually true. <laughs> yeah. so maybe, not, maybe not the best of teacher. I did, at some point, Graham, didn't you defend his the book that they tore the pages out? Yes, of? <laughs> I think J. No. J. Alfred Pritchard's uh, uh, talking about like has been maligned for too about, long. They give you the same method for evaluating poetry in Perrin's Guide to Literature, which I teach out of all the time, actually, and it's actually I think it's actually kind good. of good. Useful. This is a bad take. I don't like this at all. Okay, so uh, t- take it back to grammar, spelling, categorization, and dictionary entries of defining great ideas. Why is this a bad approach to English? You say it, it misses the point of English, but w- w- why? What? Yeah, what is it missing? Uh, they're not actually um, pushing off from the shore and setting sail in a book. Like they're not actually going through what English creates you they're ready? just learning the tools you ready for a little drop of logic here oh yeah sure it's it's missing the essential attributes what's that so when you define something in logic a definition is required to give the essential attributes of the thing so for example a backpack i could say, say all kinds of things about a backpack it mm-hmm. has zippers it's mm-hmm. made of canvas mm-hmm. it can go in a trash can like mm-hmm. i can say all those things but the essential attributes are that it's a bag and it goes on your back wow. right it's okay. a backpack yeah and so having them work on Everything peripheral to the actual practice of English is missing the essential, which is communication, crafting of sentences, and then communicating great ideas. Okay. So if they never craft sentences and communicate great ideas, they have missed the essential attributes. Dang. And so I have a I have a feeling about where you're going this going with this. I'm not going to jump. I'm not. Where I, am I, going I, with I won't this? cut you off. Wait, no, you drive that bus. That's not true. I'm you're you're way too kind. No, wait. Um, wh- where am I going with this? No, make make some your, connections. Your point is that. The math curriculum currently doesn't do the actual practice of math. It doesn't do the essential attributes of math, math, which is, uh, if I'm thinking about math correctly, is is to, like, when they were originally discovering it, they thought it was the basic language of the universe, and it allowed them to do things they couldn't otherwise do, like measure things that were incredibly high, and create cathedrals that stood even though they didn't seem like they should be able to and yeah. to create artistic works yeah. right i've thought about because you talked about cathedrals in the um uh, gates of paradise episode right that which one was it that was started before they could put the dome on top uh, the duomo in florence, florence. yeah they, and, la- they lacked the mathematic ability to Firenze. approach that problem my kids universally loathe geometry mm-hmm. but 
when I show them a book I have by Albrecht Dürer about the actual practice of geometry, he's creating fonts, he's showing you how to make rose windows, how to make monuments and sculpture, and how to actually set it up so that a a design on a column Mm -hmm. will look the same size at the bottom as it does on the top, even though you're viewing it from much further away, right? It's a geometric change in the pattern so that it fits the viewer's eye. Like all all of those things are the practice of geometry, but our kids never get to do it. And same, Graham, I'm, I'm sure you've referenced it on this episode before. You have an interesting math problem that you like to present to your I do. leadership class. Yes, I present to them. Um, it is uh, affectionately known as the murder circle. Um, but what it is, is it's the story of, um, uh, what's his name? The Jewish Just- historian... Uh, Josephus. Josephus, yeah. Josephus was at one of the uh, was part of the the rebellion against Rome, and he was in one of the, uh, a sieged fortress. I think it was um, the one that starts with the M. I can't remember. Um, and uh, so it's and then, but they were going to die. Like the Romans were going to get them, but uh, Jewish law prohibited them from committing suicide. They didn't want to get taken by the Romans. So what they decided to do was they'll sit in a circle, and you would kill the person to your left, and. And then the last person would either surrender or commit suicide. So only one person was committing a grievous fault, not everybody. Mm-hmm. And um, Josephus apparently like did the math quickly in his head to figure out where he had to sit mm-hmm. so that he would be the last man standing and then surrendered to the Romans and ended up becoming best friends with the Roman general who took over the uh, the fort. And that Roman general, general one day became emperor and Josephus was saved. <laughs> A great um, story. But uh, and so the so there's an equation that you can get to right. of figuring out. So like my, the question I ask my students is, um, if n equals the number of chair, a number of people in mm-hmm. the murder circle, um, what is the basically like the f of n or, or mm-hmm. the l of n of where you need to sit so you mm-hmm. don't get murdered? So you're the last person standing. Right. And we spend uh, some time whenever this is. I do this in leadership class whenever we don't want to do the other curriculum. <laughs> Um, Can you say that? Are you allowed to record that? I mean, here we are. Um, and uh, there's a way to get to it. And But I never tell the students the answer. I just let them try to figure it out for the hour. And then they usually leave. And then they'll just Google it and get it solved for them, <laughs> and that, which is kind of annoying. But some students will figure it out. It's pretty during complicated. Yeah. I was wondering if do they get to an answer during class? Yes. Um, they, figure, they figure out pretty quickly not to sit in an even number chair. So if one is the first person... One kills two, three kills four, et cetera. So right. don't sit in an even number. And then there's like um, the number ends up being something like I, – I, I can't remember sure. the equation off the top of my head, but there's ways to do it. Yeah. yeah. And the, if would you even be able to think about whether that belongs in – is that an algebra problem or uh-huh. geometry problem or a calculus or a – like is there any way of even – It'd be algebra, I think. What, that, I was just – it's a very practical problem when the Romans are coming up the uh, coming up the fort. It kind of doesn't they're all matter. like, bro, get in the circle, and you're like, one second. And you <laughs> Need got to your think chalk about it. Yeah, the yeah. chalkboard. You do a binary. You're like, okay, uh, <laughs> I gotta figure this out. Uh, uh, so how do, be, how do be your bull? That's okay. <laughs> you kill you and you kill you. <laughs> They're like, what's he doing uh, what's over there? The, what's Josephus up to? You're, you're in for this, right, Josephus? Oh, yes, yes. 100%, I have a, yeah, I, definitely. It's a great plan. <laughs> all right. So I am coming at this from an essay that I know you all have read, but it's been very long, uh, a very long time. So uh, you obviously will, will remember all of it. A Mathematician's Lament. Is this a name that rings a bell? No, it does not. Yep. Do you remember the last time that there was a Magistorum Forum held at this school? I do not. <laughs> <laughs> that was when I, first, that's when I first started five no. years ago. But... Uh, a, a Mathematician's Lament is, started out as an essay written by uh, Mr. Paul Lockhart. It's from 2002, so it's not classical. So please tell me about how we're not actually classical stuff you should know. Um, it was eventually expanded into a book. And if you want to really? read more of his thoughts on education, you could read that. But I'm focused on the original essay. Essay is from 2002. The book is from 2009. And um, I was trying to look up information on Paul Lockhart, and there's not like a ton out there. I would love if he listened to our podcast. That would actually make my day. But he uh, taught, I'm not sure if he currently teaches there, but at least until 2016 was at St. Anne's School in Brooklyn, might still be there. I um, mean, he published a book in 2019 on algebra. So, um, th- uh, and I found like nothing else about the guy other than that. So he's a math teacher. That's the important part. And he wrote an essay about the problems of how math is taught. And that, I think, aligns with why I had this, like, nervousness about talking about this topic on the podcast, because I don't want, I mean, you know, my episodes are boring, but I'm not intentionally bringing, like, a boring topic to the table. And I think my apprehension comes from most people's experience of math, which only really happens in school, right? Yeah. You're not, most people don't go home and, like, solve proofs for fun, though, um, 
if you're on Twitter, Mr. Nassim Taleb, I think every Sunday solves a proof. Like that's his for fun activity. It's I just can't understand it. Like it's it's I just realize it's what do you mean? I mean, his proofs are things I don't understand. Oh, yes. Who is this guy? He Nassim Taleb? He wrote uh, Black Swan is probably what he's most known for. Anti-fragile, mm-hmm. skin in the game. Uh, the are these, famous curmudgeon. Are these si- Scientology books? <laughs> yep. Every yeah. single one of them. We're, this is a Scientology podcast. Too. Wait. Um, wait let's see. Nassim Taleb, uh, a tr- uh, very f- infamous uh, trader who made a bunch of money mm. in shorting the market right at the right time. Got it. Um, uh, Lebanese... Um, I believe Lebanese that yeah. right. family fled yep. Beirut during the war in the eighties, kind of lost everything. He was in New York, made a, made a money on like one big trade, but had been consistently losing money for a long period of time, like little losing little bits of money and then hit it and then hit and was basically going long vol on some uh, trades. That means long volatility. Long volatility. He's betting on the volatility He's of the betting, market yes. for those and who don't then, know the slang. Um, uh, 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 one big when the thing that was eventually going to happen was going to happen. And his whole point was um, we think we, – we look at the world and think the world is sort of um, – the way it's been going is the way it's going to happen. It's going to continue to go. Um, and we discredit and disvalue volatility and ras- rapid changes. And the smart money – bets on those rapid changes and has the iron stomach to withstand the small losses until you hit the, until you hit the big payday. Um, and then wrote all these books and is notorious for getting it onto fights on Twitter. Yes. These are all true things. Okay. So that is, uh, again, the statement of why was I nervous in presenting this? I think most people have a bad background with math as a topic. Um, gentlemen, I don't know if this describes you though. How, how do you all feel about the, you know, math feels like too big a thing to have an opinion about, but I I guess think back on your experience in high school, maybe college, if you took math there. Um, what is your background with math classwork? When I was in elementary school, I had to do math in French because I was in a bilingual program Oh, cool! and I didn't know French very well. (laughs) And so I could do the last math lesson. The teacher would teach it and I could do the lesson. And then when we got to the word problems, I didn't know what the word problems were asking me to do. Right. So I would just be, I would just look at the word problem and I'd see that there was an eight and a three and then a bunch of French words that I, I didn't understand. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, the lesson was multiplication. So I'm just going to multiply those letters, those numbers together. And it worked? Like maybe 40% of the time. <laughs> and so people thought I was dumb because they were like, oh, he keeps getting these answers wrong. But I was like, I can't read the language. That's hilarious. Um, that was my elementary school. And then eventually they figured it, I figured it out. And I didn't do math in high school, but... Um, really? Sorry, I didn't do French math in high oh, school. Oh, I did math sorry. in high school, not sorry. in French. Uh, and I, I always enjoyed the logic puzzle problem of it. My dad did his undergrad in physics and chemistry, or just physics, um, and so he was very mathematical, and then, um, and then went into theology. So he would always help me with math homework, and he, I, I just, I would always remember him getting not frustrated, but. He would say things like, oh, it looks like the book or it looks like your teacher wants you to do it this way. You could also do it this this way. way. And to me, that made it – as a young – that had such an impression on my brain that, A, math wasn't math. Math was um, compliance. Mm. And that made me frustrated and I didn't want to have to – I hated – not that I hated compliance. I just sort of – you know, I think every lots of kids look at math and say, "Oh, why do you why do you make me do it in this this sort of systematic approach? Why don't why can't I do it this other way that makes sense to me?" But then you get grades taken off and you get frustrated. Right. So that was sort of my my experience with math. Okay, fellas, the intellectual life is a worthy pursuit, but in the modern world there are lots of distractions. I mean, the internet is literally a machine that is dedicated to stealing our attention. That's hard to, uh, to keep the intellectual life if you've got something that is constantly uh, stealing your attention. There's been tons of apps that have, out, that have come out that, are, that block websites or limit restriction to websites. But this new app called Canopy, which is a sponsor for today's episode, is awesome. Not only uh, can it block entire websites uh, that are big time sucks like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, but if you're a parent, it can also block explicit content uh, for your student Uh, If you're a school, uh, it's something that can not only just block entire web pages, but it can block partial web pages. So if there is 
uh, a web page that has worthy content but has questionable advertisers. Uh, Canopy can block that stuff out. Um, yeah, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's great. And, and the vast majority of Canopy's use case scenario is on mobile because uh, studies have shown that most teenagers now interact uh, with questionable and explicit content on their phones. I remember when I used to teach out of school a bunch of years ago, we tried to do one of these like first generation website blockers and kids could get around it in like 30 seconds. Um, and, uh, uh, but with Canopy, um, uh, there's, uh, the parental controls of it are, uh, are top notch. Um, uh, there is the parental app and then the app that goes on the phone. Students can't, uh, can't get around it. They can't access web pages through like Google Maps, which is even a thing that you can do. Uh, they've thought of everything to make sure that any kind of uh, front-facing or any kind of like web browsing application is going to have Canopy integrated with it. And um, you guys that listen to our podcast, you can go to canopy.us backslash classical and you can get 30 days for free and up to 20% off forever. So if you sign up, you get 20% discount forever. That's great. So canopy.us, that's canopy with a C, dot US backslash classical for 20 days free and 20% off forever. Hey, Jay. I loved math. Really? Oh, yeah. Cool. Uh, this is... You were a mathlete. Yeah, I promise. This, this is going to sound like some humble bragging. Um, they shipped me off to the high school in eighth grade so I could take high school math classes. Good for you, man. And I ended... I finally finished with my math career when I took pre-cal as a sophomore. And mm. I was like, I just don't think... I'm want to do this anymore. Right. I got, I, it felt like math had become impractical. Like that was, wasn't for the real world. And I didn't think I wanted a job where I was doing math all day. So it seemed like I'd reached the end of my necessary math. But prior to that, I had been going to competitions. I think I won regionals and got second in state at some point. Yeah. Um, but I, I all have always loved math. And so I, I remember this essay and I don't know, I have certain feelings about it. I'm sure. Uh, what will you think? It's, yeah, well, we'll get there. It, there are impractical parts to it because it's more of a Jeremiah. It's just a condemnation of uh, how math is currently done without much of a much in the way of where to go forward. Right. Um, we'll get there. So th- uh, my example of changing the English curriculum comes from this opening. S- oh, sorry. I guess for um, background, I don't have any like strong memories of math. I had good teachers and I had bad teachers. Um, I, 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 I took math courses all through. Uh, college or um, high school and college. I took um, extra class. I took extra probability courses, probability stats, math courses in uh, college, and just enjoyed them. Almost got a math minor, but didn't. Um, and more out of like I had to graduate at some point. Other than yeah, so nothing really. I, I've, I've taken math. I've en- I enjoy it. Um, so I don't have maybe these negative associations, which again is what made me want to look into the history of the subject, which we'll get into at some other point in a different episode, not this one. This one is just about me not wanting to talk about this topic that I find interesting. So go into the essay. We'll talk through, you know, we'll give a summary of it. All of my episodes are book reports. So uh, the opening story uh, in uh, Lockhart's essay is about a musician waking up from a nightmare. And the idea of this nightmare is that the way music is taught is that people that students don't get to create music at any point in their musical education. It's all about theory. It's all about reading sheet music. It's all about changing the key, like, you know, transcribing music into different keys. And like, that's how you learn about music (laughs) at no point do do people actually get to do music um, and make mistakes. Um, It's very boring. He wakes up in a terror and then um, a painter starts to have the same series of nightmares. Um, I, in my example about English, um, the thing I just kept thinking is that, so like AJ, when you're talking with ninth graders about the Iliad or the Odyssey, in some sense, aren't they unprepared for the Iliad and the Odyssey? Yep. Like there are things going on in that book that they won't understand and that... And they won't even understand it by the time they graduate. Well, maybe. But I guess the... So it's easy to make fun of, like, you know, my obviously a year of grammar, a year... well. Grammar is a classical subject. No. So grammar spelling, like a year on each of those would be really miserable. But in some other sense, couldn't they be helped by an extra year of training before coming to these books? Like, does that line of questioning make sense? They're unprepared in some way. They could be better prepared. And I think that's what, that's why math is structured the way it is. We'll get to that eventually. 
But does that does that make sense as a question? Yes. So, but you would say that we shouldn't do things that way. That they should dive into books before they're ready for them. Is that also correct? I don't know if I would say that. Oh, so, I, I think the two are disconnected. Training in training in the spelling and grammar is for the composition, not for consumption. So, but so let's say in your class you do also have essay writing. Maybe this is the better example. Mm-hmm. You have essays in your class, even though you're asking. Um, ninth graders to compose essays on huge topics that have been debated for thousands of years of mm-hmm. written history. Um, and then, you know, before that in oral history in, in that sense, like they are absolutely unprepared to opine on certain things, but you still have essays in your class. And I would much prefer that they spent an extra year training in grammar and spelling. Do you think so? Before, oh, yeah. before writing more yes. essays. So then would you ever consider cutting essays from your curriculum to then have Graham better prepared to assign those essays? No, oh. I mean, we're talking about the way our, even our school is structured yes. and the way student development is structured, sure. but the, the brain of a small child is particularly tuned for grammar. Like they like to collect facts sure. and they like to memorize things. And so the grammar needs to happen when they're young. Mm-hmm. It's, it's incredibly difficult to teach at my stage. I will teach them things and it will, it will just fall right out of their brains yep. and it's just not prone to it. And then the systematic uh, organization of language should happen probably somewhere near junior high when their brains are trying to make connections and figure out logical things. Mm-hmm. In high school, those kids just want to be known. That's mm-hmm. the time for expression. expression so by right. the time they meet me, they should be prepared with spelling, grammar, and structure. Uh, that's the ideal. It's We have a hard time meeting it because we get kids from different schools and oh. you know changing curriculums in the younger years, but that's the ideal. But even at those younger grades, they're still writing essays. Well... Yeah. You're saying they should be expression should be a part of each grade, but at younger ages, they should be focused on like spell the words correctly. And then they should be focused on make your logic coherent and make your, make your sentences actually structurally sound and coherent. Make sure each one makes sense. And then when they hit essays, that's when they hit me. Sure. Uh, Graham, you were shaking your head at points along the way. No, I'm just, no, no, I agree. Like uh, for spelling, like little kids, elementary school age kids love memorizing those little songs and the best songs for them to memorize are like rules about grammar. Hmm. I before E, except after C, things like that. Um, above, beyond, below, beneath, whatever the song is for all the prepositions, right? I, I don't know the song. I, 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 I memory palace those. So some of our kids have this song that like, da 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 and they can memorize all the prepositions. You get, little kids love doing that stuff. They don't know why they're doing that stuff. They're just right. singing a song. Right. And, and then in the, in the, in the middle years... Um, when kids start like being jerks, not jerks, being precocious and saying like, why, why do I have to do this? Why is the sky blue? Why, why do I have to do homework? Uh, then they're, cause they're, they're wanting the connections to be made. And so that's when logic is taught. And that is when, um, um, arguments are made. Um, and, um, uh, kids will want to like, if someone says, you know, you, you, you can motivate kids to, to write things. Um, by if they, you know, by saying, uh, I'm trying to give an example. Um, I will only answer your question if you can write it out in a good sentence. And he'll yes. be like, "Fine." And then he like sits down and writes it out. And then you can point out and say, "No, nah, I didn't do it correct." <laughs> I will only answer. And then he'll be like, "Right." And you do it over. And then because right. they're motivated to to get to that answer. Right. And so by the time they're in high school, they yes, the AJ is right in saying that. Something in the development of the hearts and minds and souls of a kid is that the older they get, they want to they want to be able to express and be known, and they want to be heard and understood. They want to be heard and understood. Uh-huh. And if they don't have those tools of grammar and logic, then their wanting to be heard and understood sort of manifests itself in ways that you that it they will make themselves heard or understood. Um, regardless of what skills they have with tools. Sure. And if they don't have the skills with tools, they'll be heard and understood in ways that are... They don't sort require. Of, they don't require them and are, and are perhaps sort of... Um, Unrefined. Less or, refined, yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess to bring the analogy back to math, um, uh, little kids should be memorizing... Little kids should be memorizing equations. They should be, be memorizing uh, A squared plus B squared... You know, yeah, this, um, this is actually this is great. So this is not the direction I thought things would go, which, again, is like the subtitle of all my episodes. But um, so I didn't expect a trivium direction, but I think you're on to something here. So at the point that uh, when you all were in high school or even again, you teach high schoolers at the point that they're in high school, they're still doing grammar work in math. So your example with the Pythagorean theorem, theorem 
a, a thing that they need to memorize is a squared plus b squared equals c squared, right? Mm-hmm. Or the quadratic formula. Like that's a, a thing that must be memorized. Um, yeah, what is the rhetoric of math, I guess, is the question. That's one way of thinking about it, yeah. That's one way of getting at it. Um, what's another way to say it? Um, that math is, so like the Pythagorean theorem, what is, what is the purpose of the Pythagorean theorem? Exactly. The volume of a triangle, right? It, Isn't that the Pythagorean theorem? The, am I thinking, I'm thinking the, uh, no, that's not the right one. It's length of the hypotenuse. That's mm-hmm. the, yeah. um, in, in a, for a right square, if you have the length of two legs, you can figure out the third leg, but there's something like bloodless of just presenting. Yes. This is the formula. Um, go forth and memorize it. Yeah, no student, when we're reading Paradise Lost and we're talking about um, Satan's soul and despair and we're having this as a conversation, uh-huh. just to think back to last week's yeah. podcast, uh-huh. no student's ever like, Mr. Donaldson, when are we ever going to think about souls and despair in the modern, in our life, sure. right? That doesn't happen because sure. they can see why that's a, that's a connection. Now, English is sort of easier, that's an easier bridge to cross in English class than mm-hmm. it is in math class. But isn't there, there there would be a bad way of teaching English where yes, you yes. teach the themes ahead of time and you're like, memorize these Here's themes despair. This and then is what despair recognize means. them in the story on, uh, totally. uh, and give the homework assignment that's on page 433 of Paradise Lost. Yep. Satan experiences despair. What are the three? Like that, that would be a bad way to do it. Yes. And I think it's closer to most people's like typical math experience. And again, this is not, I'm not commenting on the school. I'm just saying like math, can, math can be kind of boring for people that aren't interested in it. AJ accepted. Math should be, I think, I've, I've never taught in a math class, so this is a definitely not, like, not even an amateur comment. But I, I don't see why it can't also be done in the same way, that, in, a, in a question-based way. I mean, Aristotle, I'm sorry, Aristotle, Socrates, Socrates does this with the slave boy. And what's, what is that story? He's trying to prove that the slave boy has, like, precognition knowledge. Of yeah. <laughs> and, if, and if I'm not mistaken, it's to teach, it, it's he is able to talk this boy into, into the Pythagorean theorem yes. by um, uh, asking, yeah, again, it's a Socratic method of, you ask questions, but then to get to the point of drawing out this triangle and realizing this relationship between the three sides. Yeah. Um, so uh, in my example of the murder circle, uh-huh. what we do is we start to put a table together and we say, all right, if there's two people, where should you sit? Number one. Right. If there's three people, where should you sit? One kills two, three kills one, sit in three. Yeah. The next one, if there's uh, uh, if there's uh, four people, you should sit in um, in one, right? And then so they go through it, and then they realize, like, wait a minute, it goes one, three, one, three, five, one, three, five, seven, mm-hmm. and then they see that it begins to cycle and repeat, and mm-hmm. they're like, and then they can see the pattern, and then they try to like figure out why there's that pattern, and so I, I'm not, I don't teach them, I'm not teaching them anything. We're just going through questions. Yeah. In my mind, I know what we're trying to get to, right? But in the students' mind, they're just trying to figure out how not to get murdered, yes. Um, which is a great motivator, yes. Um, so I mean, I, I feel like yes, that I don't know if this is what he gets in that in his essay there, but that is a way to do math. Now, is that a way to do precal? I don't know. It's not a fast way to do precal. Let's put it that way. It is certainly not a fast way to do precal. We'll get into his his end of the essay is just his takedown of like every grade of math algebra one geometry algebra yeah. two pre-cal calculus um but even that conception of them being in different categories doesn't really make sense it's it's all math it's all a logical approach to numbers and shapes mm-hmm. right it, to split them into algebra geometry may not make sense or be helpful um i guess th- tying in somewhat with your josephus example he he he's talking about how to teach the um, area of a triangle formula um this is you know um, base times height divided by two right so there's one way of teaching math where you put that on the board and say if you want to figure out the area how much space is inside of this triangle you here's you know b times h divided by two right is how you would present that um but that doesn't if you were to try and figure that out, that's like, you would never phrase it that way in the first place. Um, you wouldn't know what a base is. You wouldn't know what a height is. And why isn't it, why isn't it enough to draw the, the similarity that uh, if you take base times height and multiply them together, what, what, what shape do you get? What area of shape do you get? A square. Yeah. Square or triangle, right? Or uh, not a triangle, square or a rectangle, right? It would work for either one. Well, then why not take a rectangle, draw a triangle inside of it, 
And then the problem for the student is, well, what's the relationship between these two things? Let them figure out along the way, oh, the rectangle is the full amount, then the triangle must have half of that um, area inside of it. Or say, like, draw a line Mm -hmm. and say, okay, how long is this line? They say it's um, four inches. Or do you do do inches in math? We did centimeters. I mean... Uh, we did inches for sure, but okay, fine. Do four inches. It probably should be. You could just say units. It, yeah, this it actually four. doesn't matter. So yeah. four whatevers, and then we say, okay, um, we're going to stack four whatevers on top of each other up to a certain height. Yeah. Um. Uh, and so, how many of these should we do? Fifteen. All right. So we got four, and then how many of these are on top of each other? Fifteen. Okay. And so then the area is four stacked on top of each other time by fifteen. And so then they fi- find out that four times 15 is the area and we've created a rectangle, right? Like, you, you know, right. it's, there's, there's ways to do it. It's just, um, yeah, anyway. Okay, that all sounds real grand, but... I have three we problems. We got an economy to and run. And those three problems are... Well, I mean, we kind of do have an economy to run. So here's the point, is that mathematics is, is not something that you can easily grasp in, what, the seven years between ages five and 12, and then 12th grade? Like, so we got to weed out the dummies? 18? Is that what you're saying? No, my point is, is that some of these things, some of these, these principles and formula were discovered by somebody after years and years or even a lifetime of work. And the proofs for them are incredibly complicated. How are you going to get your students to do that over the course of an hour. And, and the, the, if the expression of math, say, we can, we can easily get to an expression of math in, in small cases, right? Yes. Um, with geometry, I can make a rose window, I can do some of these basic things, but it starts getting more and more complicated really quickly. Mm-hmm. And if the thing that they eventually need to do is figure out the weight, like how much each joint on a bridge will bear weight mm-hmm. as trucks go across it at a certain speed and wind is coming from sheer direction and the gravity changes because of the tide and the right. moon. Like my point is that when they hit senior year in high school, they might still be in the grammar stage. Mm-hmm. They might still be gr- gathering the grammar of math. Yeah. And the problem is that we don't get them to the expression of math because the, because the expression of math is so complicated and it comes in college. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and and math has been developing and rolling over years and years and years. It would be like trying to teach science uh-huh. and then trying to have us establish and qu- get them to the point where they discover osmosis mm-hmm. and discover how to calculate mass and discover like those, all of those things can be really complicated to get to. And we simply don't have enough time to get them to the po- place where they need to be in via the question method. That, that has always been my beef with this guy's notion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It sucks. Mm-hmm. It sucks to sit and learn grammar way yep. past when your brain wants to do it. Right. But if you ever want to get to the actual expression, you kind of have to at some at some point. Do you think people get to the point of expression as is now? Um, I think that more expression, and what I mean by expression is like, you know, using math to do things, right? right. So using the, figuring out the hypotenuse to figure out how much cloth you need to dissect a room by putting mm-hmm. up a curtain, mm-hmm. right? I think these things could be done, but you can't, you can't do it with everything. And you you just you can't <clears throat> say say for learning latin right everyone hates the first year of latin you have to memorize sure. words it sucks it's no fun right but the joy of latin comes when you get to read poetry and it's original and you get to go to rome and read the stuff that nobody else uh, can read this is great no i think i mean i don't know i don't know what that comes Lock- later i don't know what Lockhart would say. yes but um we, he would argue that that never happens in math so you start with algebra um, and then you don't, it's not like then in geometry, you move to expression. You then re, you go back to grammar, essentially. Again, I wasn't thinking of this from the trivium angle um, that you two are taking it, but it's it's true. You restart every year with a totally new field of study, essentially, as opposed to 10th grade English, you are better off for if you paid attention in ninth grade English, right? In mm-hmm. a way that geometry is actually pretty different than algebra. Yes, they both have numbers, but um, a, a plane versus... Um, equations are are very different i don't know but many of them do end up in the expression of grammar it just doesn't happen in high school or expression of math it doesn't just doesn't happen in high school they go on to business where they have to use they have to calculate profit and they have to figure out okay where do i put my stop losses if i want this particular goal over this amount of time yeah and then if they're an engineer it's even more prevalent they have to figure out how to cut down on wind resistance on a thing or create a canoe that has a certain amount of displacement because it's made of concrete, right? And they have to get concrete to float because it's a canoe. Like I've seen these projects uh-huh. 
in engineering schools, right. we just don't call it math anymore. We call it engineering, but that's the expression of math. And where we call it architecture, where they are doing math, or we call it um, computer science, where they are doing both logic and math. Sure. Or like, but let we me take, get there. Let me take your example. Uh, the it, it it would be equivalent, I think, to the earlier mode of teaching English by only do grammar, only do spelling, learn all of your themes before you actually read a book, as opposed to take what you just said and move it earlier. Why can't you start? Um, I don't think real world application is necessarily the point of math. Um, even physics, you often will assume like a, a, an environment with no gravity or no friction. Like sure. You'll, you'll do not real world examples, yeah, yeah. but even take the, um, why can't those be the subject of, um, the, f- of what you're learning earlier on, as opposed to I have to do all the prereqs beforehand. And then I get to real math in college. Cause that's even the music example. I learn all my, my music theory and then I pick up a violin. And I think that's what he would say is the problem as opposed to, um, math is not a series of things that are solved. It's a field that is still expanding. Mm-hmm. There, there are the, I forget what the, like the 12, I forget what they're called, but they're like a set of, um, mathematical questions that are unanswered. Um, and there are million dollar prizes for answering each one. I'll try and look it up in just a second, but why not present those, um, first and foremost, and then we're looking at how to, how would we get at answering those questions as opposed to memorize all these formulas and not explore what relationships you can find in a triangle and a pyramid and a picture yeah, shape. The, the thing that gives me pause is that the system that we have set up, the kids that go off and do pure math or who are interested in solving those problems yep. or whatnot, usually end up getting plucked out of the system oh, to yes. go do it properly. Yes. And so you have the, or they get punted up to the older grades because they can do it properly. And so we say, all right, here is a sixth grader who actually is really good at this, and so we boot them up to 10th grade math or whatever. Yep. Or I know you see the same thing in music programs. Oh, my goodness, this kid who's in band class is actually really great. We're actually going to – he's going to get plucked out of band class and go to youth orchestra in the city. Right. And so there's this sort of point uh, – we don't have something equivalent in English or history or the humanities because you can kind of like, I don't know stunt them or whatever. Mm-hmm. I, although there probably would be in the, the creative writing sections. Like if we force them to write not, like short stories every year right. and that the kids who really wanted to do that would probably get plucked away and go and do it for real. Right. Then even saying that they're going and doing it for real, they're going to leave our math school right. and go do quote math for real somewhere else. Um, what is the real is, thing? We're is not, a real yeah. is like, this is not, this is true of all schools. And so that to me is like, an indictment on the way that we've done it. So I, I don't, is that because we say every human person should so, hit some sort of competency of math and so that as time has gone on, we've kind of created a system like the kind of math that I did and we all kind of did the system of compliance of, of, of sort of um, doing the systems that are presented to us and memorizing this stuff. Yeah. And the kids who actually like kind of get behind the curtain and are like, I like this. Right. We're like, all right, well, we're going to take you and send you to like where people are doing this in actuality as opposed yes. to our neutered version of it or whatever. Sure. Graham, AJ, before we go any further, I want to thank our Patreon sponsors for making this episode possible. Uh, our Patreon sponsors support us at one of four levels. I'm going to go through them right now because I think many people listening, they want to be a part of this as well. They want to become patrons as well. Uh, we have a $2 a month tier. Those are Ghibellines at $2 a month. You get access to all of our episodes ad free. You also get access to previous uh, uh, content that we've done mostly at uh, conferences. Um, so you get ap- uh, access to many other uh, bonus episodes as well. At $10 a month, you get access to our our uh, in-between episodes, which we record after every single episode that we record. You also get access to our monthly AMAs, which I think are really funny, and some of our best content. In addition to all the same benefits at the $2 a month tier, you get access to ad-free episodes. Above that, at the $20 a month tier, you... Uh, at that point are giving input into the podcast. You are helping us come up with future topics to come up with future merchandise. In addition to all benefits from the tiers below that. And finally, and you heard about this uh, in recent episodes, we have added a Helios acolytes of love tier at $100 a month at this level. You are a true believer and you are the most faithful of our listeners at this tier. You get all the benefits from lower tiers. You also get 
I can't believe I'm saying these words that you get a Helios Acolytes of Love crew neck sweatshirt. You get Helios Acolytes of Love Crocs and you get uh, a free uh, copy of all future merchandise as we create it. So incredible, incredible benefits at this at this level that is only for one hundred dollars a month. You can find all of this at patreoncom slash classical stuff. Thanks again to our patrons and um, thank you all for listening. Sure. And Lockhart would argue that sometimes what what will happen is that the people who are good aren't good at math per se. They're good at memorizing or they're good at following instructions and then when plucked out, find out they're not actually good at math. Um, it, you know, it's the same as, Oh, sure. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 Did, did and they get all, to college did, and they do cal- cal- or they do some sort of high level math. They and they're like, Oh, we actually stuff, do and they're like not interested because just tell me the answer so yes. I can memorize it. Like, well, because what they were good the at was is. solving problems, mm-hmm. not, um, thinking about these things critically. Yeah. So this, this worries me a little bit because, um, we, this or it makes me think that maybe we should have kids start specializing younger and then oh. the other side of me says, no, we should be well, we should have well-rounded students that love all of these various classical subjects of, of math, English, history, philosophy, music, art, and they should be exposed to all of these things until oh. they're 18 and leave school. Sure. But I mean, I'm sure AJ is thinking the same thing. There are no subjects, right? At, at some level, even to say, yes, students should mm-hmm. have more math but they should have more math because art is mathematical mm-hmm. because science is mathematical. And even I, I, um, I, I, again, I only ever feel like I say the same three things over and over again, a classical approach to math would probably be closer to history and a history of mathematics as opposed to here, learn the formula. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know. So in that sense, yeah, I don't know how to just same thing with science class. That's that, what, that, we've talked about science class before. would yeah. be, yeah. Yeah. A history of biology, a history of scientific thought. Yes. Yeah. And that's how you would get through um, in the same way that, le- yeah. Does this get to anything, AJ, for what you were saying before? Obviously, we cover, you know, thousands of years of of history um, and we'll never do justice to all the amount of time that we're covering. But still, we say that we offer a history class, right? I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to be charitable to the people who do this as a profession and really care about it. So to, to speak to, hmm, to speak to Graham's issue that everybody has to reach a certain level of competency. So say I live in a society where everyone is eventually going to have to make their own knife because we don't sell them, right? We don't sell knives. Everybody's got to know how to blacksmith a little bit because I ain't going to do your knifing for you, right? right? Or you're going to have to pay me to do your knife and that's going to cost a lot of money. So everyone should learn how to do it a little bit, right? Well, the few people that really are like, oh, I like, I like making knives. I'm into this. Well, Mm -hmm. we can start them on advanced on a, knife. Well, not necessarily even on advanced knife making. We reteach them the basics in a different way because they're going to have to make more than just a knife. Right. They're going to have to learn how to make a sword. They're going to have to learn how to like metallurgy and all of this stuff. When right. most people are just going to take a bar stock knife, knife, you know, metal and hammer a knife out of it and do some right. grinding. Right. So we that is one reason why we might pluck somebody out is because they are they will go further and we need them to go further. Um, but for most people, just you know, grinding a knife out of a bar stock is fine. Mm -hmm. And we are okay with that. And is it going to be as fun and creative as really getting into metallurgy and creating your own line of swords? Well, of course not. You're going to make a kitchen knife and it's going to be passable and it's going to work and you're probably going to hate it, but everybody needs a knife. Um, I also think we are maybe being a little uncharitable to the people who are teaching math, right? I, I agree there should be some expression, but I remember in geometry, we had projects where I had to make something out of art and out of triangles and figure out how to fill the entire space right. and do that with colored paper and cut the paper out entirely beforehand and then assemble it and see if I had done it correctly. And I, I, I can distinctly remember a lot of different assignments where we were given a problem and we had to figure out how to solve it. And so did you guys not have teachers that did, gave you any chance at expression like this? Um. None that stand out in my memory. Same, and uh, maybe I, guess, I just had really good teachers. You might have. Lockhart's goal is not is not to be charitable, and will it many times comment on that a teacher of math should find the topic interesting. That if what if the teacher just wants to go in and teach the same formulas over and over again because it's easy, they're not a good math teacher. I don't think you would disagree with that. I don't disagree with that. Yeah, I, I think maybe we've had I've had some good teachers, and maybe I see good teachers in our school because sure. I see them doing the same sort of thing sure. where they have. Things the yeah, kids have to do sure. using math. Sure. And I said it before that I, I, I'm discussing his article. I've, I have not been in a Veritas math class, so I have no comment on any right. of them. So, yeah. So, um, 
let me get through a little bit of what uh, Lockhart has to say specifically. So um, that we've opened with this um, story of his about these nightmares. Um, and this is his first subsection, mathematics and culture. The first thing to understand is that mathematics is an art. The difference between math and the other arts, such as music and painting, is that our culture does not recognize it as such. Um, Spoken like a true mathematician. Yeah, of course, right? Uh, is this the equivalent of the philosopher thinking philosophy is the meaning of life and he's going to say math is the most artistic of arts math is the mind of god in action uh nevertheless uh the fact is that there is nothing as dreamy and poetic nothing as radical subversive and psychedelic as math as mathematics it is every bit of a few things as psychedelic as math like psychedelics is that like psychedelics okay, <laughs> uh, it is every bit as mind-blowing as cosmology or physics mathematicians conceived of black holes long before astronomers actually found any and allows more freedom of expression than poetry art and music which depend heavily on properties of the physical universe mathematics is the purest of the arts as well as the most misunderstood that's what math is wondering playing amusing yourself with your imagination what do you think about that? I mean, poetry captures the human experience well, but I've never felt like my experience was so well as expressed as by an equation that I read once. You're so curmudgeonly. I'm sorry. I, You're fine. The whole, You're, like, I'm a mathematician, therefore art is the best seems kind of ridiculous. Like, I love math. It's great. And it, I, I really do believe it's some of the founding material of the universe. And when you think about it, sometimes you are thinking about, like, you are reaching out to the mind of God. But English is pretty cool, too. And English so is, is very history. Cool. And yes. But... Like even our podcast, we focus pretty primarily on literature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, which I think is to the detriment of the other arts, right? This is, AJ, what I appreciate appreciate about you doing um, uh, architecture as episodes the or the art episodes. Like there's more to a classical education than reading books. I'm trying. I'm bad at it. I'm, I feel like I'm miserably failing at it. You're not miserably failing. I, I, I already told you this off air and I'll tell our listeners that w- watching them on YouTube is probably the best way to experience them because mm-hmm. it actually has the artwork in them. Yeah, you're gallantly failing. <laughs> <laughs> failing yeah, boldly any, yeah, and with exactly. style. But that's, uh, I, I don't know if you all have this thought just of there's more to what a person should know sure. than just great literature. I, I hear, I hear people, mathematicians who say those sorts of things and my, um, my initial thought is that I want someone, I want to be shown it, right? Like I feel that people say this, yeah. um, and I feel like if I sort of sat down and applied myself and had somebody walk me through it, I wanted to, I want, I will want to come to that conclusion myself or it's not correct, right? Yeah. Like that it's this sort of exciting and amazing field. And I remember it being very satisfying. Yeah. I remember filling out like doing all of these answers and getting the right answer and being very satisfied. It's very right. satisfying when you figure out which seat mm-hmm. not to sit in. Yes. And then you test it and you're like, oh, I was right. It works, right? That's super satisfying. Right. Um, so, but, but, ex- but that sort of realm of excitement, it just sort of worries me that it's, it's, it's just sort of like an, a, a tower that only the few can, the only the elect can get into to even understand why it's interesting. But I think, but that's why Lockhart's fascinating because he teaches at a, What's it called? It's a K through 12 school. That's where, and if I'm not mistaken, he taught primarily middle school. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he won teacher of the year many years for seventh grade is what I came across. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is something accessible, not just to sure. PhDs or to uh, master students. This is something accessible to everyone. Um, he has a, he quotes one of his seventh graders. Uh, Perhaps yeah. it's because that math is the one discipline where the gap between functionality and like enjoyment or arte. Yes. Is that arte? Not arte. Arte? No, what's the... Uh, arte the, excellence? Is that what you yeah. mean? Yeah. The, the, the gap between like doing it to be functional in the world, like techne. being able... Techne. techne being able to... Um, being able to like, you know, balance your budget, right. which is what we hear a lot. We should teach our kids to like do a checkbook. Um, the gap between the practicality and the almost like mystical enjoyment of it yes. is much it is is so much more wide than the practicality of we just need our kids to be able to fill out tax forms versus yeah. we need our kids to be able to write short stories or or like write technical instructions yes. on yeah, how exactly. to assemble a lamp <laughs> yeah 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 so this is great aj when i told you that i was going to do a math episode you brought up um, pythagoras's like number cult and to take a math class <laughs> he was today, a weird guy sure but like could someone take a geometry class today and want to start a math cult? I mean, we have some 
strange student. No, that's a joke. Sorry. <laughs> I, I had a student <laughs> who started a math cult. Please tell me that. He tried to make a math cult out of my other leadership kids. It was great. Did it work? No. Good. Thank no, goodness. they didn't enjoy but, math. But could that happen? Is the wonder of numbers taught in that same way as was appreciated you know, by Pythagoras? Uh, just as an example. I would say no to that, even if... It, even if you have a really engaging teacher and that's kind of the disconnect here. There's something you've referenced. No, who said mind of God a few times. One of you did. Yeah. So you said mind of God a few times, mm-hmm. but who would describe math as like a religious experience? It, yeah. yeah. Probably very few. Yeah, it's right. it's, it's mm-hmm. the utilitarian um, sort of angle, but how many, but just to connect that, sorry, in your English classes, how many would say that they are closer to God for having read a book or discussed a theme or discovered something new about, you know, the state of their souls. I, I think that'd be much more common in your classes based on the subject. Yeah, they're not they're not just leaving learning how to do instructions of how to make a lamp. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But even that's or just memorizing a definition or mm-hmm, just memorizing mm-hmm. a formula in the same way. I guess that's the the point to get to with it. Um that there's more going on there. Uh your comment Graham as to like what it looks like to do that. I I don't know if Euclid will actually get us there. Th- that that was my first the first answer I had in mind cuz somehow Euclid is able to go from his first assertion that a point is that which has no part. He starts from the definition of a point and ends with to construct an icosahedron and comprehend it in a sphere like the aforesaid figures. Anyway, do you see this picture? None of you cool. listening, but do you see that he goes from the definition of a point on a chart to mm-hmm. that and like each one builds on the other. Mm-hmm. So at some level, Euclid is a part of the answer to that question. Um, and we'll get there eventually, but so hopefully we'll be able to experience that, but Okay, um, just to, I'll move toward a wrap up of like what is practical here. Um, nothing, literally nothing is practical. Um, stop trying to be a utilitarian. So uh, math is an art. Math is more about wonder than it is about uh, memorizing certain formulas. It's about an approach to thinking and logic, I would say, than it is about, again, do you know how, how to calculate certain areas or how to um, build certain graphs or anything like that? Um, this is a tangent he takes inside of the, the uh, article, but that um, a way to experience, maybe this is a part of the answer, Graham, a way to experience that um, sense of wonder as, a po- as, as involves math is to not only do problems, or I think it's not only do exercises in your homework, uh, and not that you all do math homework, but um, if your method of teaching is here's a formula and here are 20 uh, problems that just require you to plug in that into that formula. That's a bad way of doing math mm-hmm. as opposed to teach a formula, give 10 exercises, but then two or three problems where you have to go beyond what you've just learned. So uh, we talked, we've talked about the um, Pythagorean theorem. I, I think this is right that the Pythagorean theorem is what's used to derive the quadratic equation. That's the negative B plus or minus Square root, B squared yeah. over, B squared minus over four, four A, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, clearly, we're very good at math. Yeah. Um, plus or minus AB. Yeah. So, for instance. Negative B plus or minus square root, B, B squared, squared minus, minus four A's. AC all over 2A. That's not a song. You made that up. No, no that's, I think that's, that's the one that's I memorized from high school. The worst. Yeah. Um, but, for instance, requiring a student Nailed to it. derive something like that um, when they only are taught the Pythagorean theorem, it requires something of them to go beyond what they've already been taught. Um and I think that is a piece of getting closer to this of, again, it's not just copy and paste from whatever they learned in class. I think in the same way of English where you teach a topic, you read a book, but they have to do the processing themselves as to what the book means to them. Mm -hmm. Right. Isn't that some part of you all do reflection activities, right? We do. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, but I I don't just want to hear like whatever (laughs) trite comes into their minds. I want to like, you need to direct it in a way so you're not just getting like, I feel... But that's the benefit... You should be nice to people. Yeah. yeah. But that uh, math has a certain rigor to it that doesn't allow for them to just like jump from one plus one is two to I feel like it should be three. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's, mm-hmm. I think, a benefit of the field that maybe English doesn't always have. There can be a hand-wavy element to English and literature. Well, the thing is, yes, when you're talking about... Well, this is... For modern people, stable sentiments is sort of a ugh, uh, a, a taboo subject. Yep. But um, what do you mean by stable sentiments, Graham? I mean that like there are there are proper well, ways you. of feeling about that that circumstances and situations should rightly elicit certain kinds of responses, and if other kinds of responses are elicited, that is an incorrect way to think or feel about something. Mm-hmm. So if um, 
Um, if a child is playing outside and my class is looking out the window and they see that child trip and fall and their paper go everywhere and scrape their knee and they just start sitting in the middle of the road crying mm -hmm. and going and getting their papers, f a bunch of my boys will laugh and I will tell them that their laughter is wrong. Right. And it's wrong. Right. That, because that's not how the human heart should should respond, should, uh, respond to that situation. Yeah. That is a controversial statement. Whereas saying like one plus two is five mm. is is, is easier to yeah. say it's wrong because you have this sort of this agreed upon logical system. And I mean, and it's completely different. Right. Uh, or not completely different, but it's it's um, we don't like the idea of that there are normative reactions to things, but we can agree that we, we are more comfortable with that there are logical reactions to numbers. Um, yes. It's, though he, he goes into, the, so like, um, what's the number of degrees inside of a triangle? At least 180. Three. 180. At least three, is that? No. Yeah. Okay. So 180 <laughs> degrees are inside of a triangle. What if I place that triangle onto a cube? Is that still 180 degrees inside of a triangle? Is it a warm cube or cold cube? That's exactly right. Um, so, in the same way that you're right to say that, like there are there are rules to math, but um, those rules can change based on the problem you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he doesn't go into like the truly um, theoretical math stuff too. He's 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 focused on just like a common person's approach to learning this topic. Um, just to wrap up, since we're close to the end of time, I'll just read some of the funny parts because this is, you know, I, I'm, I have not conveyed this, but it's a very funny essay. Again, if you just Google uh, mathematicians lament, it'll pop up. Uh, he has a subsection that is titled high school geometry instrument of the devil, which is 100% true because I hate uh, geometry. And then the very last section of it I already mentioned is he goes through the different levels of math and talks about what's bad about it. Um, I won't read all of it, um, but the standard school mathematics curriculum, lower school math, the indoctrination begins. <laughs> uh, uh, middle school math, students are taught to view mathematics as a set of procedures akin to religious rites, which are eternal and set in stone. Mm -hmm. The holy tablets or math books are handed out, and the students learn to address the church elders as they, as in, what do they want me to do here? Mm -hmm. Do they want me to divide? Mm -hmm. um, algebra one is... Um, uh, students, uh, <laughs> it just ends with students must memorize the quadratic formula for some reason. It's algebra one, uh, geometry isolated from the rest of curricu the curriculum. This course will raise the hopes of students who wish to engage in meaningful mathematical activity and then dash them. Algebra two, um, uh, why geometry occurs in between algebra one and its sequel remains a mystery. He goes on from there, but, um, yeah, th th there are problems to this organization. I'm sure we'll say more in our in-between episode here. And there's there's some interesting um, works that he's referencing in his essay that I guess we'll talk more in our in-between since we're at the end of our time right now. But it's a very good essay, and math is great, and you'll hear more about it. So get over it if that does not interest you. That's really the point of this episode. <laughs> cool. Good. Well, this has been Classical Stuff You Should Know with Graham, Thomas, and AJ. We thank you for listening. Um you can, what am I trying to say? You can find know. us at classicalstuff.net. You can email us at theguys at classicalstuff.net. Uh, you can drop us a review on any of your podcast portal uh, <laughs> What's widgets. going on? Are you, are you okay? Um, yeah, just no. review. Um, we have a Patreon if you want to patronize us. There are a couple of tiers. You can check them out. And we also have an email if you want to patronize us and just... I already said that. Well, I mean, like, Did you, the guys patronize us in Oh, patronize way. us by, yeah, like, by email. Oh, you can totally patronize us yeah. by email. Yeah. Um, and this episode was brought to you by Canopy with a K, um, and is, with a no, K? not with a K, not no, with a K, no, with a K, K. no, with a K, yeah, Canopy with a C, with a C. Sorry, Canopy with a K one is that the, we weren't. That's the movie streaming thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Canopy with a C, uh, and you can find uh, if you do canopy.us slash classical, uh, you can get a discount, and that's awesome. Yes. Okay, and we will see you next time. Bye. Next time. Bye.